welcome to the Deep Sea Podcast Pressurized, a short, punchy version of our full-length shows. So if you want to get right to the scientific point, this is the place to be. If you really enjoy the topic and you think, actually, you know, I'd like to know more, just match the episode number and you'll be able to find the full-length episode in our feed. And now, to get right to the point. We were covering sort of habitats, and this has been one that's been requested for a long time. So what if the habitat is another organism? And we've we've touched upon symbiosis a few times, and I think we, in colloquial sort of language, we use symbiosis sort of incorrectly. But symbiosis basically just means living together, or together living from the original Greek. So it's any time of close, long-term biological interaction between two different organisms, and they need to be different species. And symbiosis can be obligatory, so that means that they have to live together, or these organisms won't survive independently, or it can be facultative, which is sort of optional. So there's lots of different ways that symbiosis comes together. It's not necessarily always beneficial for both parties. And there's loads of different ways of defining it. There's five broad groups. So one that we often call symbiosis is when sort of two species both benefit from the relationship, and that's called mutualism. If one of them benefits and one of them isn't affected at all, so, you know, something tiny living on something absolutely huge, it doesn't even notice, that's called commensalism. If there's no effect to either of them, that's called neutralism. If one is benefiting, but the other one is being harmed, that's parasitism, which we're going to talk about today. If one has no effect and the other one is harmed, this was a new one on me, and I I had to look at some examples because I I couldn't think of any off the top of my head. Immensalism, an example they gave of that was, say, a huge tree with a little sapling in its shadow trying to grow. The sapling's got no effect on the big tree at all. It doesn't care. But the big tree is removing light and resources from the, the little tree. So that was an example of that. And then if it's negative on both characters, so that is competition so maybe competition for resources so yeah i thought it's interesting that we use symbiosis only in its fluffy nice everyone benefits form but actually it just means very close association of, of organisms that was very interesting tom i learned a lot there so which leads us on to parasites to another organism as a habitat type in the deep sea who should we talk to about that? It's actually somebody who's come up. I think we may have even teased this, and I was really glad he he was up for having a chat with us. Yeah, now this is a guy that I think his last cruise was the first one I ever did way back in the day. So I didn't realise at the time that I was actually sailing with a lot of the, the big names. And there was a guy there called Rod Bray, National History Museum, and he was picking parasites out of various deep sea fish and trolls. And anyway, Tom gave him a call. I'm joined by Dr. Rod Bray, a parasitologist specialising in the systematics, phylogeny and biology of parasitic worms, particularly the flukes. His work on deep-sea parasites remains influential in the field since his retirement from the Natural History Museum in 2004, where he worked as a scientific associate since 1967. And I know you're still a regular visitor to the Natural History Museum because that's how I managed to get James to track you down. You can't seem to stop scientists and get them to retire properly. That seems to be actually when they get most of the work done. Well, yeah, I think we've been pretty active since uh, since I retired in 2004. And uh, in fact, I'm doing field work next week and down in Australia, so I'm still active. Wow, you're getting that far away. <laughs> yes. When I retired, I, I more or less gave up on cruising. I did a couple of cruises after I retired, but then I, I've got, had a long association with University of Queensland, so I've been working with in the South East South Pacific on the fish parasites there. And for some reason or other, I thought that might suit me better in retirement than cruising in the North Atlantic. Yeah, yeah, the slightly more comfortable conditions. <laughs> but uh, I have, um, did a couple of cruises after I retired with um, Monty, Monty Preed. Yes. You know Monty, presumably? Yeah, yeah, he is. Um, he was my sort of mentor. Yeah. Um, I worked with him in Ocean Lab for a while. Mm. His, uh, his deep sea fish book is forever open on my desk. <laughs> That's I can imagine. Yes, he was very, very helpful. And because you know, obviously I couldn't afford from the museum to run cruises like that myself. So I was very fortunate to get on quite a few of Monty's cruises. But um, no, that was interesting because we started looking at, at macroids, which were starting to think, you know, you're getting deep sea parasites out of out that sort of thing. And um, we, some of the um, chimeras and things like that, we, we got some interesting stuff out of. But um, that was working sort of on the upper shelf really and they're down to about a thousand fifteen hundred meters down the, down the slope rather so it was it was interesting and i was sort of learning what i was doing and making all my mistakes in one go <laughs> i hope <laughs> but um you know finding ways of collecting things because the problem with looking at parasites is you have to get a host and then you have to open it up and look inside it and you need to really do that fairly rapidly after you've collected the stuff otherwise 
gets very horrible. Yeah, it's a race against time with anything deep sea. They they break down so quickly. Yeah, that but, atmospheric pressure, and atmospheric temperature, things just melt yeah. in your hands. That's right. But the, the the stuff in the body cavity isn't too bad. I've certainly opened up macrurids and uh, cusk eels and just been greeted with a, a mass of worms. But things that are actually within the tissue, I can imagine that's a lot trickier. Yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, also you can get decent specimens if you do it fairly rapidly. But, I mean, you, you obviously lose some. If it's coming up through a great depth, you get this stomach extruded through mm. the mouth. So you lose all the stomach parasites, probably. You can't really tell. <laughs> and then sometimes you get the rectum pushed yeah. out and uh, you lose rectal parasites. So most of the material that I collected was intestinal parasites. So you, you catch most of those, okay, I think. You just have to get down and do it. What I used to do is to collect good samples in the first, say, four hours and then freeze a lot of stuff. It's pretty grotty. But you can count things, that sort of thing. Yeah, it's such a rush when you you know a cruise comes in. Yeah, that's right. But um, you know that's part of the exercise, and you, you get get used to it. If it was easy, everyone would do it. <laughs> that's right. I mean, it did turn out actually that when I uh, worked with Monty and in the um, abyssal plate, that this is the only time any sort of parasitology has been done in in the abyss, as far as I know. I've not seen anything that really goes that deep elsewhere in the literature. There's not much literature anyway. <laughs> Not that's been systematically looked at. No. We find something particularly interesting, we'll put it in a jar. But I think from what you've said already, you need to be dedicated to it. You need to be actively looking for, for parasites. And, and deep sea samples are so rare. Everyone's fighting over them. You do, really. I mean, yes, a lot of the ones that you're looking for, they're quite small, a lot of them. And um, you need to know what you're looking for, really. You get used to it but after a time. But it means that uh, it's fairly labor intensive. But it's, it's re rewarding in that you're finding something that, really nobody's seen before so it's it's worth doing and the parasites there's so much to be done so many areas in the in the world that haven't been explored at all young folk i know just starting to think about doing this sort of thing with um modern techniques particularly molecular techniques and that's what we're hoping to encourage on this basically we've had a, a lot of listeners ask about parasitism and i know a lot of our listeners are, are sort of undergrads so we're hoping to seduce some people into parasitology it's a very open area right now there's lots of research to be done now i mean there are ways of getting at things like the hydrothermal vent stuff people are now starting to look at, at that area and that's really fascinating it's, it looks as though there's a completely different fauna there you know parasites as well as everything else but the, we have managed to get a bit of molecular phylogeny done on some of our worms and they are as it looks to be a unique radiation around that sort of area. So, that, you know, there's really interesting stuff to be done in there. And because of the life cycle, how that works down there, you know, fascinating and completely open area really at the moment. Yeah, that's certainly an area I want to get into because there's some unique difficulties to the deep sea relative to, to shallower parasitism. Well, that's right. But you now you can tie up a life cycle with molecular means, means that you can actually do some proper life cycle studies. Because before it was very difficult. You'd pick out a, a nice worm from an intermediate host and say, well, it looks like that, or it, look, it could be something like that. But they do change their morphology quite considerably during development and metamorphosis. So quite often the larval stages or the early stages are really not identifiable with that adults in morphology lots of multiple species that turn out to be one yeah we're finding that i must have to admit we've, we've not done really population dynamics works on deep sea stuff but i you know i started i finished collecting in the early 2000s and sequencing wasn't that easy or cheap in those days but now i mean we've been doing stuff on the on the reef fauna where we find there's an enormous complication in the actual population genetics of, well particularly digenian parasites but that'll be the same wherever you look yeah, you just find find more and more. What are the sort of main groups of parasites we find in the deep sea? Well, the ones I'm looking at are uh, digenians, so that's a trematode, so that's flatworm, flatworm group, very common in marine environments. Within the group of um, flatworms, there are three major uh, parasitic groups. That's the tapeworms, histodes, and the ectoparasitic flutes, the monogenians. Neither are monogenians or tapeworms are that common in deep sea teleosts. Cestos are very common in elasmobranchs in the deep sea and everywhere else. And monogenians seem to die out towards the, the deeper waters. These have a direct life cycle, so you have to have contact between hosts for it to pass on, whether there's not enough close contact between hosts, organisms, to sustain the life cycle. Might be the reason why there are fewer monogenians. There isn't really a swimming stage. They've got to actually bump up against each other. No, no, not a free, not not a 
because the Didinians, they have a much more complicated life cycle. They have a, usually three hosts and go into a mollusk, often a snail or a bivalve, as the first intermediate host. In that host, they reproduce pathogenetically. Organisms at that stage are called parthenetic, and, um, and they produce enormous numbers of offspring called circari, which they come out of the... Uh, the first intermediate host and, and in various ways get taken up or swallowed or burrow into the skin of the second intermediate host, which could be almost anything, crustaceans, annelids, a lot of them in kind of derms, uh, small fishes and things like that. And then the final host gets the parasite by feeding on the intermediate hosts and uh, that's where the adult worm matures. Then virtually all hermaphrodites, and um, then they produce eggs, having been usually been fertilized. We think sometimes self fertilization, but usually, they, as far as we know, they um, tend to cross breed between individuals. So the um, the the Genian life cycle is complicated, but it does give because of the enormous numbers of cicaria produced and the enormous amount of eggs produced, they do seem to be able to sustain a deep sea life cycle much better than some of the other groups. They hedge their bets. Hedging their bets, yes. I mean, it's, a, it's like most marine things. Uh, they produce enormous numbers of offspring and a very tiny percentage actually survive. It's just interesting that there's this sort of two reproductive phases. There's the mollusk phase, which is just using it as a bit of a factory. Yeah. And then, then there's that intermediate stage where, where it's sort of predator-prey relationship. So they're, yeah. they're reproducing in the mollusk and in the final host. That's right. It's um, a way of producing enormous lot of offsprings so that you do sustain a population. That, you know, sometimes when you think about it rationally, it's quite amazing that it uh, can survive. Yeah. But, they, you know, they're the group I've worked on most, so I might be a little bit biased. But <laughs> they seem to be the most the most ones you find of flatworm parasites anyway. Of course, there's lots of nematodes in these things, which I haven't really explored. And then, um, then there's things like the um, ectoparasites, the copepods, particularly pretty common down in deep sea. You'll probably come across some of them on macroids. You have these sort of black welts on the surface of the head of the macroids. You can see that that's a, a sac produced by a parasitic copepod. And um, it's full of a sort of black inky stuff if you burst them open. I didn't know that's what those were. Yeah. There's quite a few copepod parasites. Then you're getting into things that I know virtually little things about, like all the apicomplex, and what we used to call protists, um, mycozoans, and then, um, of course, viruses and bacteria. And, you know, everything's got some fairly large number of parasites in a lot of them um, are completely um, unknown or can only be deciphered by molecules nowadays yeah we've hardly touched on sort of bacteria and viruses yeah my view from of what i understand about deep sea parasitology comes much to a great extent from from digenians and uh, it does um, emphasize the fact that we know so very little and a lot of what we presume about what's going on down there is related to what we know happens in shallow waters to the same sort of groups of parasites. So we presume the same sort of thing is going on in the deep. But in most cases, we, we have no direct evidence of that. That's a lot of extrapolation, but it's all we've got to work on. Well, that really is at the moment. Although, as I say, there are some work being done in the States now of people actually finding hydrothermal vent stuff, having got several of the life cycle stages sorted out. This is a very exciting area that is possible to do now. When you mentioned about extrapolating from shallower groups, uh, some of your work found a sort of link between polar and cold adapted species sort of relating down to, to bathial depths. It's something we see we see a lot, you know, in, in becoming cold adapted seems to give you a bit of a leg up to being deep adapted. Yes, yeah, that's definitely what appears to be the case. We, certainly the, the deep sea fauna does seem to be very close related, particularly to the, the Arctic and the Antarctic. But there's been quite a bit of work done on the Antarctic stuff. And um, the parasites are very similar, possibly not the same species, but sort of have quite a few genera in common. I mean, we've done a bit of a bit of work has been done on the molecular phylogeny, and we're pretty happy that they are pretty closely related. Yeah, it does seem to be cold adapting is very important to them. Um, you know, where, where you are in the deep sea. And also, I mean, there's, there has been quite a long tradition of this thing called equatorial submergence. Uh -huh. I don't know whether you get that in fishes or... But um, with the duck parasites, a lot of the things that have been known from the higher latitudes seem to be found in the deep sea and, you know, in equatorial regions. This is sort of just an idea that had been floated for, for years, and it does seem to have some, some basis. The thought I had is, mm. is that, you know, when it comes to colonizing the deep sea as a parasite, of course, you can yeah. you can join your host. You're almost taken down there. So as the deep was colonized after one of these mass anoxic events, 
as the host evolves and recolonizes the deep sea, I guess it brings its its parasites along with it, and they've got to either adapt or or bust, basically. Yeah, that's right. No, it does look as if that is the case. Uh, we don't know how much actual life cycle is going on in the abyss, whether most of the stuff that we're finding has been taken down there by uh, fish as they, as they get deeper. But it does seem that there's quite a lot of um, invertebrates in the abyss that could be intermediate hosts. I don't think there's any shortage of candidates down there. And uh, it does seem to be there's uh, some sort of um, relationship between parasites and, and the fish going down in, within their actual individual life cycles into deep water. Yeah, of course, they've got shallower stages as juveniles, so they could always pick them up as juveniles and then take yeah. them with them. They're in the plankton, actually, as juveniles, so um, yeah. there's plenty of chances to pick up some hitchhikers. The other thing that we find is that the anthropologic fishes have a much smaller parasite burden, partly because of the, there's not a surface. You know, the, when you're a demersal, you've got a surface where everything falls down to sort of thing. Mm. And where, whereas if you're in the pelagic regions, particularly in the deeper waters, there seems to be a much poorer parasite burden there. I suppose it could only really be trophic transfer. Yep. You're not likely to bump into another one. <laughs> it, it tends to be something eating something else. Yeah, that's exactly the case, yeah. Do they have to become less specialised? Yeah, I think that's true. The few that have been picked up in bathic pelagic fishes are, as far as we know, very generalised, very non-specific parasites. Whereas the ones in the benthic fishes are often pretty host-specific. There does seem to be some quite close relationship with the uh, bottom or, or the slope or whatever. The further away you get away from that, the smaller number of parasites you pick up. Until you get into the epipelagic areas where there's a lot of photic stuff going on, and then you do pick up parasites there. There's a sort of big zone in, in the middle of the ocean where there doesn't seem to be a lot of parasite transmission going on. Everything's a bit too spread out. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes I think it's a miracle that these things survive at all. But I suppose it's enormous numbers down there, and we're very much scratching the surface of what's going on. There's a lot of scavengers. Do you think uh, scavenging is a good vector? Yeah, I think probably scavenging is, is how most of these things are picked up, yeah. And the grenadiers, at least, are incredibly long-lived. You can get 40 to 80 years in an adult, so that's a long time to, yeah. to build up a parasite load. Well, that's it. I mean, the parasite loads are quite good in grenadiers, but um, as you say, they're probably being affected for... Um, 40, 50 years. I mean, another thing is we're not at all certain how long the parasites actually live, but certainly some of them seem to go to quite a big size for a parasite. Mm. I think it's uh, it's not a straightforward life cycle down there, and I think it is uh, to do with the fact that they are so very long-lived, a lot of these things, that they manage to sustain the parasite life cycle down there. The complexity of the, of the life cycle, the sort of multi-host, multi-stage, is probably a bit of a blessing to these long-lived fish because they've got such a tight energy budget. They're living on, on so little food that if they could reproduce within the final host, uh, it would make sense you could easily overwhelm and, and kill something like a grenadier on its 40-year life cycle. Whereas they live a bit more in balance at this stage when they're when they're sort of ingesting the final stage. Yeah, none of these things actually reproduce in the final host like that. So they all have to be taken by food, and uh, so that yes, you're right. It's a it's a, a balance. Obviously, if if they uh, started uh, producing so many, they killed off the the host. It wouldn't be um, an efficient way of running a parasite life cycle. Yeah, they're playing the long game. Sometimes it at the intermediate stage. I mean, there's a case of some, for instance, the um, some parasites get into ketognaths and um, arrow worms and uh, they change the colour of the worm. So they become more prominent and the small fish go for them more readily than the other. Huh. Sometimes at the intermediate host stage, the parasite does want the death of the host. It wants to be eaten at that stage. Yeah, that's exactly, yes, that's right. Yeah, manipulating the host is quite creepy. Yeah, there's some, quite a lot of really frightening things like that. Even in man, some of these parasites can cause actually change change behaviour to some extent. It, it's a common thing that the intermediate stages try and get their host eaten, try and make it more prominent or less mobile or something like that, so it's sort of consumed more easily. Frightening stuff. There's been some theories about congregations of deep sea animals being a good vector, so things like a whale fall or a carcass that's going to gather a lot of these grenadiers in one place and i guess they if they're gorging themselves they're probably pooping as well so they're shedding eggs onto the onto the area while while others are 
are there and, and I'm guessing for these ectoparasites, the ones actually on the bodies, that feeding frenzy where you see the fish sort of brushing up against each other, that's how they're transferred. Yes, yeah, I should think so. But I don't think anything's been done on the parasite aspects of that. And again, that would be a very interesting thing to do. And then get down there now with your submersibles and whatnot and do some proper collecting. Yeah, yeah do some careful collecting rather than trawling. Virtually everything that I've collected have been done from deep sea trawling, which is laborious. <laughs> and the other problem is because you're doing a lot of damage at the bottom as well. Yeah. Which is not a good thing to do. And um, there hasn't really been any alternative. But now with things like some of the submersibles and things that can get down there and uh, actually collect things individually would be a very useful way of, of dealing with that. We did do a little bit on hydrothermal vent parasites in the um, southeast Pacific. That was, was collected by fish trap, and that, so that's something that could be, be used. Yeah, you don't get many specimens, but they tend to be in really good condition. That's right. And a lot of stuff gets damaged in a trawl. So if you're after ectoparasites, I'm guessing a trap is great. One of the things that surprised me the most, you know, it is parasitism. It is a one-sided relationship, but it's... It's much more in harmony than I anticipated. Our perception is something infects your body and it's trying to kill you, whereas actually it's, it's just trying to survive. From fishy areas of things, you know, you talk about parasite load and it's, it's just a, a constant balance in, the, in a fish and, and maybe a sickly one, it might push them over the edge because it is a drain on the fish's system. But it's perfectly normal to be, you know, living in balance with these parasites. Well, yes, parasitism is a very normal arrangement, and uh, quite often it's a indicator of a good, well-balanced ecosystem if there's a good parasite form in, in there. <laughs> Some of these free-living parts of the life cycle, like the cicaria, which come out of the snail and find the second intermediate host, these are in the environment, and if the environment's polluted, you're going to lose those parasites. That's really interesting. That's a good take-home, that parasites are an indicator of a good, stable and healthy <laughs> ecology. It's really interesting. Well, I mean, they are a result of the meeting of individual organisms and the good feeding habits, good feeding conditions. So, yeah, it's, a, it's certainly an indicator of that. And that they need so many hosts, they'd be the first to reveal if something had happened to one of the steps along that chain, rather than us just maybe focusing on, on apex predators and things at the top. It, you know, if there's a breakdown at the lower trophic levels, yeah, maybe parasite load is the, the giveaway. Yeah, that's right. I mean, these sort of things have been used as indicators of pollution and of indicators of movements. I mean, some of the life cycle, I'm talking about shallow water stuff that we know more about, some of the life cycles we know the intermediate host doesn't occur in a certain area so that we know if the parasite is in that certain area, that host has come from somewhere else. You know, it's a rough indicator of movement and stock conditions. Um, so it has been used fairly successfully as an indicator in in shallow water conditions, there'll be one or two cases where they've tried to do it with deeper water, but we often don't know enough about the life cycles to, to make very strong inferences from that. Yeah, we don't have the data, but it would make sense with using the, the larger hosts as a way of, of getting around. You know, if, you yeah. were, if you're a deep sea pelagic parasite, then you've got the, the diurnal migration yeah. and everything's sort of coming up and down during the daily cycle. And then yeah. we don't know what the macruids are doing. Like, it's such a mystery how they reproduce, but it makes sense that they, they all get together at some point. Yes, there must, must be somewhere. When you're working on parasites, you get used to thinking of parasites as fascinating organisms who deserve to live sort of thing. Whereas then generally people probably think of them as problems and uh, something to get rid of, which they are in some cases, but um, in lots of cases they're just part of the natural system. Is there any competition on, on the host? Are there any parasites that, that actively fight over their host? Well, there are, yes. I mean, there's, um, there's some fascinating stuff done, in, the, say, in the mollusk, where there's pathogenetic reproduction. In some mollusks, where there's two or three parasites in the same mollusk, different species of parasite, there is predation of one parasite on another. Wow. <laughs> there are groups of these individual organisms that are developed in the part by pathogenesis who are like soldier ants, the soldier parthenite that actually consume the other species. Oh, wow. I mean, that's um, snails and things on in shallow areas where they really, really study them in detail. But there's a sort of eusociality in um, some of these individual species at that level, in the first intermediate host. Yeah, that's... That's pushing the definition a little bit. That, that could be seen as advantageous. Well, yes, it could be, but it, often it just means that one parasite is more 
dominant in that host. And often the, the mollusk hosts are, in fact, uh, castrated by their parasites. So there, that can be a problem. Yeah. There's all sorts of complications like that. Of course, if you've got a, a group of parasites in a, a gut of a host, for instance, they'll be segregated. Really? They pick an end? Some, you know, front end and some, middle and some in the rectum, you know. And also, it's been found that um, if you've got a parasite, two parasites in a in a host, they'll segregate a bit. If you've got several parasites, they'll segregate more tightly. Right. So it depends on what groups of parasites you've got in the host, where the parasite is in the host. Because if there's a lot of different species of parasite, they'll segregate into smaller areas than if there are fewer parasites in the host. Ah, and it's not specialization within that parasite. They will, you know, say one that's usually found at one point in the gut will, will move over a little bit to stop competition. Well, there are parasites that have their niches along the gut, but their niches can be bigger if there's less competition going on. And then if there's competition, then the, the niches will be restricted more. So, they, you know, if they're on their own, they're not going to be right through the gut, for instance. They'll, they'll have a, a niche, but they'll be quite a wide niche probably and much smaller if there's competition going on. That's really interesting. It's not to do, to do with the deep sea specifically, but presumably this is going on down there. It would, it would make sense. So there's, yeah, lo- sort of looking at this internal environment as a as a habitat in itself. Are there are there predators on the parasites, and do the parasites have their own parasites? Are we Russian nesting dolls? Well, they do have their own parasites. Um, not much known about that, as far as I know. But you do get um, other parasites, usually um, protists or you know apicomplex and things like that in in the Digenian, certainly. And also, actually, we, I remember once we, we discovered a lump on a... There's a thing called otodistum, which lives in the body cavity of sharks. It's a digenian. grows to quite a big size. And there were big lumps on it. We sent it to a expert in, in the States somewhere, and he looked at it and said it was a neuroma, a cancer. So as far as we know, that's the only cancer we've seen in, in the digenian. No one has spared. No. The sharks are supposed not to have cancer, aren't they? They're immune from cancer, so it's, their parasites aren't. Yeah, that's what I was going to say, because originally, you know, it's quite often a, a less scientific cure for cancer is uh, is eating shark cartilage. So evidently, it doesn't work on their parasites. <laughs> <laughs> no, apparently not. Oh, that's fascinating. I like that one. How about predation? Are there any parasites that eat other parasites within the host? Well, only the ones in, I was talking about in the snails earlier. But you do find occasionally parasites with lumps out of them as if somebody's chewed on them. But um, whether that's... Uh, uh, you know, just a bit of cannibalism or <laughs> whether it's actually a competition between different things. I don't know. In fact, there's one group. I mean, it's not, again, not deep sea, but we find it a lot in, in reef fishes that virtually all the parasites have nibbled away. And <laughs> I don't think there's any, not much actual predation of the parasite. Yeah. You're already in a meat habitat, essentially. So you don't need, maybe you don't need to go hunting around for other flukes. You're, you're already surrounded by food. <laughs> yeah, again, it's um, something that um, virtually everything I've said in the last few minutes has been stuff from shallow water that we can easily study. But one presumes that similar things are going on in the in the deep sea. Yeah, we have to until we until we know more. But it makes sense. Oh, that's that's fantastic, Rob. Was there any sort of final thoughts? Well, I said really at the beginning, it's a fascinating area, needs a tremendous lot more work, and I would recommend anybody who's got a, uh, that sort of uh, urge in them to look at parasites. They're a fascinating group. And um, and there's an enormous amount to be done on them. Oh, that's amazing. Thanks so much for your time, Rob. I really enjoyed that. And that was a pressurized version of one of our full-length episodes. If you enjoyed that and you would like to hear the full-length episode, just match the episode numbers in the feed. Thanks for listening. We'll deep see you next time, and I hope to see you all later.